שישים שעתי עד So I just like to welcome all and sing it real quick. My name is Ezra. I work here at the Alaska Heritage Institute in the language department. Um, and today I will be introducing Marilyn Jensen, who um, Marilyn Jensen will be doing a lecture on the topic of lateral kindness, a subject in which she has conducted research and provided workshops on for the past several years. Now do shitin. And Dutsa or Dutsa Agle is Inland Clinket slash Tagish Kwan from the Car Cross Tagish First Nation. She belongs to the Gapta Way D clan under the Tagish Kitit um, in the southern Yukon Territory. She has taught First Nation governance at Yukon College and collaborates closely with many indigenous determ or communities as a consultant for focusing on indigenous self-determination. For the past 20 years, she has taught engaging workshops on government, on indigenous history, land claims, and self-government for numerous First Nation governments and organizations. So this lecture series will be about strengthening our community. Um, this will be one of the first three lectures that we'll be having. The next one we will have is August 9th by Pete Tapish, Lyle James. The next one after that will be followed by Doug Modic on August 23rd. So without further ado, let's welcome Marilyn Jensen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kudashish uh, to I just wanted to acknowledge where I am, Gunashish to the Akwan Nation for all of the beautiful work, the place that so many people live and celebrate and do ceremony and very important work. I also wanted to say Gunashish to the Alaska Heritage Foundation. We've been trying for quite a while to uh, um, you know, have a chance to present the lateral kindness work here over here in Juneau. And so I'm very, very delighted to be here today and really, truly honored. So Gunashish, thank you so much. Um, are we moving? Okay, good. So I already was introduced, but I just wanted to uh, just reiterate that I am from the Yukon Territory. I'm Inland Clinket or Dhaka Clinket. I'm also Tagish Kwan, which is an Athabascan or Dene nation. I'm the daughter of uh, the late Doris McLean, Guna, and Philip McLean. Um, great granddaughter of uh, Mariah and our Agnes and Peter Johns, Mariah and Tagish Johns, um, and I really uh, happy to be here. So many beautiful memories of Juno, of celebration, of being inspired, and also you know, wanting to acknowledge the amazing work that Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation has done. Just last week, we discovered that there are, there's video footage of Angoon, 1982. Um, on the Sea Alaska YouTube page, and how much we learn from that, how much we're inspired, you know, to imitate our ancestors, and you know, the work is just incredible. So, I just wanted to start off very briefly with just a synopsis of you know what what I deem to be extremely important, what which has guided me, and of course that is the you know like the matrilineal. Um, line that I follow. I follow my mother, as we know, we're a matrilineal uh, society, and I just wanted to put this photo up there. And also, what has become really important to us over the last 10 years is this notion of it is possible to heal from intergenerational trauma, from all of the things that you know we've we've been through as a people, as families, as clans. So I wanted to just show you a, a photo of my great grandma, my grandma, my mother, and there's me, and then my daughter, and how over the generations our people have shown resilience, have shown incredible strength to be able to get through all of the challenges, the difficulty, and essentially trauma you know, that exists in our communities and in our families. And this whole topic of lateral violence and transforming it into lateral kindness really falls into that, uh, that pillar of self-determination, which I call healing. Because our elders and our, our leaders, you know, in the Yukon, in the interior, and I know here as well, 
in Alaska when they were envisioning um, you know, uh, basic human rights for, for their descendants, for their people, you know, to fight for our lands and our resources and for us to have something. A major pillar of that is healing. And sometimes, you know, when you're, I call it, out there in the trenches of our communities and things are very difficult and challenging and we're faced with a lot of, you know, emotional trauma, sometimes these things feel impossible. So I, I often look at this, this photo and think of my great grandma and she was the first generation that, um, you know, uh, felt the impacts of initial contact and change, massive change in our community. And then my grandma right beside her, that's when she was a little girl. She was the first generation to go into residential school. In Carcross, it was Chutla Residential School run by the Anglicans. And all of the, the damage and the change and the, the loss, the displacement that happened through that generation. And then my mom right in the middle, who's now in the spirit world, and I know many of you had the opportunity to meet her. She was a woman before her time. She was a warrior. And she, she was able to instill um, a sense of you know, um, importance in us, a sense that you are good. She always used to say, our people are beautiful, our people are strong, our people are noble. And she used to tell me, you're a princess. Don't ever forget who you are. You know, so, and in a time when society was telling us the exact opposite, you're bad, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're wrong. Everything about you is wrong for the simple fact that you're indigenous. That's the strong message that society was putting on us. So that was my mom's major legacy that she left, is that she said, no, that is not accurate. You are strong, you are beautiful, you are noble, and don't ever forget who you are. And then there's me that I've spent most of my life teaching about who our people are in the larger world not just only to our people, but to everyone else in governments, different governments. And I feel like I've spent a lot of time trying to validate our story, you know, and our experience to other people. So I'm beyond that now, thankfully, because that's not really what I think I was born to do. And then there's my daughter, Guna, who walks into a space knowing absolutely 100% she is strong, she is beautiful, and she is noble, and she, and she knows who she, are, she is. And no one can challenge that. No one can tell her any different. So it's a story of intergenerational trauma, but healed. And that is a really important message that our people need to remember when we get caught up you know, in the day-to-day -day grind, in the trenches, I often call it, when we're in our own communities. The hardest place to work for an Indigenous person is with our own people, in our own community. It's hard, and we're going to get into a little bit why, talking about lateral violence. So I also just wanted to share, um, you know, who we are. Um, obviously, my, uh, my colleague Thomas isn't with me today, but uh, Thomas and I have been working together for about 10 years. He's not Indigenous. He came into my community from Ottawa, Ontario, from the federal government, and it took me about 2.2 seconds to decide I liked him. And why is because he actually listened to me. I had a really important job. I was like the senior government official. With, I say it like that because it sounds really ridiculous for what the job was. <laughs> and you know, I was just freshly out of grad school, I had a degree with indigenous uh, governance, and I was treated very badly in my own community. I, it was like you don't know anything, uh, and we're not going to listen or you know hold you up or support you in that. So Thomas came waltzing in one day and was the only one that listened to me. And you know, acknowledged my expertise and my what I had to bring. And a lot of lateral violence is our people doing the opposite to us, of not hearing, of not validating, of not acknowledging, not holding us up or supporting. So back in 2013, I was teaching at Yukon College, and I was teaching a class called um, uh, Indigenous. Uh, what was it called? Um, healing indigenous organizations and communities. And so obviously I talked about lateral violence one day because it is a huge issue for us. It's a huge issue for us, for our people, you know, trying to work along together and we're always dealing with this negative, dark energy, you know, ever present. Um, and so um, I was doing that and I got a call from 
the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, which is one of the nations in Whitehorse. And they, they were like, hi, can you come over? Because some of the people that called me were some of my students in that class. And they were like, can you come over? And so anyway, I went over there. And they strategically had some elders. They had the chief. And they had, um, they had like the executive director and some of the students. And they're like, so our elders council has been, you know, talking and they're in discussion. And we're having an election. We're having like a tribal election in a few months. It's always a really bad time for us in our community. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of like really neg negativity being, you know, uh, thrown at each other. It's a bad time. So this time we want to be more prepared. We want you to teach the leadership, the chief, and all the counselors, and the whole staff, all 100 of us, and the whole community, all our citizens, and our youth, and our elders, and everyone, we want you to teach them about what lateral violence is, and how can we fix it? <laughs> and I was like, whoo. I'm like, OK. And so I, so I was like, can I, get, can I ask if someone can help me? And they're like, sure, whatever you want. So I called Thomas up, because we had been doing some work together. I'm like, Thomas, do you want to help me teach Kwan Lin Dunn about lateral violence? He goes. Sure, what's lateral violence? And that's where we started. <laughs> so we started in 2013 and immediately started rolling, um, you know, researching the topic. One of the things I noted is that lateral violence has been around my whole life. I have a very vivid memory of being five years old and thinking to myself, how come people are so mean? Why are people mean to each other? Why do they say like such stabbing, you know, demeaning words to each other. I didn't think it like that at five. So I know it's been with us for a long time, but Indigenous people haven't named it. We haven't, like, you know, identified it as something, this phenomena, until about 20 years ago is when I first heard the term lateral violence. And so we started doing research, and we just immediately jumped in. So when, you know, um, I heard you say research, a lot of the research comes from the people. Because since 2013, there's been over 3,000 people that have been through the lateral kindness, um, you know, like a circle. We always often sit in a circle. It's a, you know, it's a learning environment, but it's a very, very like informal. We do teaching and sharing, but we also do a lot of sharing with each other. With each other. So a lot of what we what we share uh, is informed by the people. And so we started with Kwan Lin Dunn, and yes, we did all those people, but like two weeks later, the Nacho Nayak Dunn First Nation up in Mayo, Yukon, they're like, we heard you guys are doing lateral violence workshops. Can you come up here? And it just, that's what happened. So the whole Yukon, every single nation, we've been in the communities over and over again, all of their leadership. And sometimes the leaders are like the very first ones. And they're there saying, we know we have this problem, and I do it sometimes. And I don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to do this. So let's figure out how we can fix it. So it's been an incredible journey, you know, and I started off wanting to be a social worker um, and, and then took Social Work 101 and said, I'm out, and then got into anthropology and indigenous governance, and here I am back in that kind of social, you know, like uh, the, the uh, wellness and healing arena, which has been amazing. You know, I can't even, I can't even express how many moments of just such joy and you know a sense of this is a miracle and our people are beautiful our people are strong and they are noble that we've experienced in this process so i just wanted to share a little bit of how this happened and since 2013 we've been all the way to newfoundland canada with the Halapu First Nation, we've been all through BC, uh, a lot of work in Alberta, uh, definitely all through the Yukon, and now here in Alaska, so I'm so excited. Um, obviously, I have a lot of friends, you know, uh, in Alaska, friends and family, and, and so people see me posting quite a bit about lateral kindness, and I think, like, that's how, you know, it kind of gets on people's radar. And we all agree this is extremely important work, you know, and we have to look at it. Um, our, our workshops, you know, I'm just giving you kind of a synopsis, just a skimming of the surface of our workshop, but we always come into that space and say, this space is safe. We're not here to blame anyone. We're not here to shame anyone. All of us have participated with lateral violence in one way or another. We're here to like, you know, like look at it, to deconstruct it, just to put it out in the middle of the room and try to understand what is this? 
And like, why is it so predominant in our community? And work from there because we can't fix something if we don't understand what it is. So that's where we approach it from. And, and my, my role in the work that Thomas and I do is very much you know, from the Indigenous lens. Of course, I do all of the teaching and sharing about our culture. Thomas is, you know, considers himself to be an ally and would never step in there in that place because he knows, you know, that's my my role. So he largely comes from the like the psychological, you know, like the the, the what's going on with people psychologically and all of that role. I'll try to fill in for him today, but I just wanted to, you know, do a shout out to Thomas because he's um, an amazing person. So to start off with. Um, you know, we always start off really acknowledging who it is that we are and where are we, you know, and, and who are the people of that nation. So obviously we're here in Aquan country. Uh, this is Clinkett, Clinkett country. Woohoo! The homelands, beautiful, you know, rainforest. And one of our major messages is that we already know how to be kind. We already know that. It is so deeply embedded into our culture entrenched into our culture. And you know, I really want to hold up all the language learners and teachers here because you're doing such hard work. You are doing the most important work for our people. And I also acknowledge that in, you know, in some communities, it's a very uh, difficult place. There's a lot of lateral violence that exists in that, in that space sometimes. And so, but the more I learn about language, the more I realize our indigenous languages are love languages. They're languages that s truly see each other, that acknowledge each other, that hold each other up, that often express how important you are to me. I love you. We love you. There's my daddy's people. I love you so much. You know, there are such languages of love. And um, so much is built into our culture. Oh, I might have to call down. Kai got the message again about the low battery, so I'm not sure if it's plugged in properly. Um, so, you know, we really acknowledge that our culture informs what we refer to as, as lateral kindness, which I'll define for you in a second. We already know, you know, we already know how to be kind and loving and supportive and encouraging, but it was displaced, you know, uh, it was displaced from us, just like everything else, just like our language, just like our songs, just like our, you know, our, our hakusti, our way of life, uh, everything about us was displaced. And so, uh, so were, you know, um, our teachings about how do we interact with each other? Even how do I talk to somebody? How am I supposed to talk to somebody? You know, it's amazing how many protocols are, you know, revolve around the way that I talk to somebody. And they're all beautiful. They're all very, very uh, eloquent and they lift people up. You know, it's, uh, I remember some of our elders, you know, uh, when I was growing up. And there's a lot of beautiful people today still. You know, it's not like we're all just mean, you know, and just glaring at each other all the time. Um, you know, but I remember some of the old elders. And if they came into a space, they would acknowledge every single person there. Go around, hello, how are you? How's your mom? <laughs> How's your grandma? Know about what you're doing. You know, and, and say, I know what you're doing. I see you over there. I see you over there working really hard and trying. And I want you to know I support you and I love you and don't give up, you know? And compared to sometimes the things that we hear today are like, you're doing that wrong. You know, uh, who said you could do that? you know, um, those kinds of words, which I'll get a little bit more into. But our main point, you know, is, and here's this quote again, our people are strong, beautiful, and noble. But my mom said that, and we are. And we have to remember that, you know, because we do get caught up. We get really caught up sometimes in the pain, you know, because I have to say lateral violence is painful. You know, we can't just say, oh, put your big girl pants on and man up. That's what people told me before I went to work in my community. And, and I, I also want to say, like, my community supports this work 150%. So they don't mind me sharing my story of lateral of how when I experienced lateral violence. And when I was working there, someone, you know, before I started working there, someone said to me, whew, girl, 
you got to like be mean. You got to be meaner. Basically is what they were telling me. You're too soft. You're too nice. You know, you, you're, you're going to have to get toughened up. You got to put your big girl pants on. Someone told me that, you know, to work for our own people. And I was like, but that is like not who I am, you know, but no, nope, you got to be, you got to be like that to work here. So it really is, you know, um, a, a very different way than how we would do that. I wanted to also share, you know, our own values, and you guys are probably all familiar with this list, but I wanted to highlight just a couple of, um, of these values. I only have an hour, so I got to make sure I don't, you know, um, spend too much time on one thing or another. So I wanted to highlight a couple of these tribal values. Hold each other up, you know, to be supportive, to be encouraging. Listen well and with respect, because a lot of times, you know, when we're in these situations, we're not listening to hear. We're listening and formulating, what am I going to say back to you? How am I going to, like, prove that I'm right? You know, how am I going to, like, lateral violence you back? You know, like, here's my shield, and I'm just going to be tough with my big girl pants on, you know? So we're not really listening. And this is a huge one. Speak with care. That is such a huge value and law in Klinka culture, and, and Simshan, and Haida, and everyone else's, is that we can't just be haphazard with our words. You know, I just can't come marching into Aquan country and just say anything, you know? I have to be wise with my words and think about what I'm saying. I also remember elders back in the day saying, you can't just say any old thing to people, right? You can't just go up to... You know, Vantat uh, uh, country, and just say whatever you want to th- those people. Why? Because I'm not just Yadol Tin. I come from the Dakluedi people. I come from Karkras, Natasihin. I'm Dhaka Klinket inland. And even further than that, I'm Klinket and Tagish. And everything I do is a reflection of all of them. My mother, her mother, her mother, her mother, her mother. So we're not just individuals out there just doing whatever we want. You know, we have accountability and responsibility to our people, to our family, to our lineage, to our mothers, to our clan, and to our community and our nation. So it's super important is that we have to think, we really have to think. And, you know, I'm trying to make this, um, uh, you know, this presentation very specific to language learners. And I know you do that. I know you're doing that for the very nature that words from our languages are coming out from your mouth. You're thinking more about it and how it fits into our protocol. Extremely important. So I just wanted to shift, you know, into what are we even talking about? You know, one of the things we, we um, uh, discovered very soon was we have to be more definitive with what we're talking about when we're talking about lateral violence. You know, we need to be on the same page. We found that um, there were definitions existing. We found that um, people had, you know, um, uh, brought forward the terminology indigenous lateral violence already. Uh, it was mainly like in Canada, we have uh, a number of uh, national indigenous organizations, and one of them is the Native uh, Women's Association of Canada. And they're like the first ones that kind of started bringing forward the concept of there's a thing called lateral violence and we have a problem with that. So I was like, woohoo, go indigenous women. And, you know, and further to that, we can be really, you know, like mean to each other, really mean, you know. So uh, it was, I thought it was like, a, you know, an amazing thing that they, that they brought that out. Um, okay, go back to there. Oh, I wanted you to see my little unhappy face. So be, be a really, really, you know, like basic terminology of how we define this is members of the same oppressed indigenous community seek power by pushing each other down, working against each other and protecting their own and projecting their own pain onto people closest to them. You know, the, it's like you don't exist, you have no value, you don't belong. Those are some like major ways that people assert lateral violence. It's like I walk in here and I'll, who wants to be my victim today? <laughs> I do, we do a lot of role playing. Okay, Kaylin. I walk in here and it's like, I don't even see you. You don't even exist to me. 
you, you're so not important, I'm not even going to acknowledge your existence. Like, ugh, might as well just shoot an arrow into my heart when, we, when people act like that. You know, and when you're out there in the arena doing important things like teaching language or trying to learn language or dancing or whatever it is, you know, working in uh, governance, whatever it is, when you're out there in the arena, you become a target. It's another thing we've learned, you know, and it's not about you as the individual. When people give you that glare down, that's not about you. It's about someone else's stuff, someone else's own pain, all right? So when people are projecting their own pain at others because they don't know what to do with it, right, is really how we define lateral violence. I mean, it's much more, um, there's much more to it than that. And we will, those of you who will be in the workshop, we're going to really get into it. We're going to really try to understand what's going on below the surface, you know, because people are not revealing a, their whole self to you. They're revealing very little, you know, and a lot, as we know, a lot of what our people are dealing with is a lot of pain. But, you know, just, to, just very briefly, lateral violence presents itself in ways that are demeaning, belittling, when we belittle each other, uh, being discouraging, uh, undermining things, you know, and, and sometimes I get a little silly and sarcastic, but it's kind of like, oh, look at those youth, they're trying to learn their language, I'm going to go over there and wreck it, you know, which is like, it makes zero sense, it's like, why would someone do that? But it's about them and what's going on with them, you know, and we have to figure out how to approach that in a loving and kind way, but also with strength. Uh, Thomas and I call one of our tools, which I'll share very briefly later, uh, demonstrating loving strength, you know, in dealing with lateral violence. So discouraging, undermining, threatening, intimidating, um, shaming, that's another one. That's a huge one. Shaming, you know, and um, blaming um, and excluding. That's a really big one. A really big one that we found. It's like, oh, you don't, you shouldn't, you don't live in Carcross. You shouldn't be here. Oh, your eyes are green. You're not indigenous enough. You're not clinket enough. You know, you're this, you're that, whatever it is. And those messages are meant to say you don't belong here, which are so, so painful for our people. Because yes, we do belong here. We know exactly where we come from. Our stories go back 10,000, 50,000 years that tell us exactly where we come from. The Dakhluwadi people were the first Tlingit people to come inland and settle in Tagish. Did you guys know that? That's our story. We were the first to come in and settle in that area, right? And this is our story. So yes, we absolutely do belong here. But when your own people, the people you love the most, the people who are supposed, inherently are supposed to be protecting you, holding you up, unconditionally loving you, are telling you you don't belong here, you might as well just shot an arrow in my heart again. It's very painful. And that's another one of our important messages is that we can't just say, oof, I'll just toughen up, you know, because these things are very painful and they hurt people. And they've caused a lot of, you know, um, a lot of uh, pain in our community. People have left their communities. People have disassociated themselves away from their families. And people quit their jobs. You know, in the Yukon, we have self-government agreements. We need our people. It's our most, most valuable resource. And when we can't even keep our own people working for us because of lateral violence, it's a problem. It's a problem. You know, so anyway, I just always want to say, like, we can't just say, oh, it's nothing and get over it, because it is something. And, you know, like, very briefly, like, how did it happen? Where did it come from? Because we know, you know, um, kind of from a traditional lens or perspective, um, maybe there was, you know, obviously we don't always agree, and we shouldn't, we, you know, that's a bit unrealistic to think that it was just utopia that everything was just, you know, like peaceful and perfect all the time. But when we look at lateral violence specifically, which we also, you know, falls under emotional violence, um, I think there was very little of that because people knew how to talk and interact with each other. So we were disrupted, you know, um, uh, our group collectively, because that's a really important part of the definition of lateral violence is the group collectively experienced oppression, right? That's a huge uh, factor of what lateral violence is. So 
uh, a lot of oppression and violence in the process of colonization, which colonization in itself is violence in every way possible. You know, the, uh, the whole destruction of a people, uh, displacement of land, resources, all of that. You know, and, and I think we're at a place now where, you know, we can talk about this and be realistic and approach it in a way that we have to understand where we've come from to know where we're going and to be able to fix things. And in Canada, uh, um, you may have heard, that, you know, we're really pushing this concept of reconciliation, which means to repair the relationship between Indigenous people and Canadians. But we can't do that if we don't understand where, you know, exactly our, what our story is. So for our story, you know, we, we know this, you know, the people, uh, Indigenous people know what our story is. These experiences have caused deep, deep, deep emotional pain and injury and harm in our people. And it, this may sound like very, very naive, but sometimes when I'm out there, you know, and I, and I do refer to it in the trenches sometimes, in our communities, in the community, you know, where this pain is very, very, like, out there. It's raw, you know, and, and sometimes I feel like, wow, it's so, like, we're not healed yet. You know, we're not quite there because the pain is very, very, very substantial. You know, people are hurting. And when people, uh, you know, can't address the hurt, the grief, the trauma, all of this, and they don't know what to do, they have no voice to fight back because a lot of colonization and oppression is you don't have a voice, you have no rights, you can't fight back. And if you do try, you're going to jail. If you do try to stop your children from going to residential school, then the, the RCMP are coming here and taking you to jail. So it's like a, a removal of people's ability to self-govern, you know, to be self-sufficient even. Uh, just a loss of rights on, on every way. So all of this gets internalized. These very complicated, painful feelings get internalized. And uh, you know, one of the things we noted is, is that a lot of people don't have access to counseling or therapy or any kind of way to address it. Displaced away from our ceremonies too, right? Which was, you know, kind of what I believe the mechanism in our traditional societies that helped us deal with things like this. Um, and so it gets internalized and it starts showing up as really, really complex emotions. Things like internalized shame. That's that inner voice that says to you, Marilyn, why do you think you can go to university and get a degree? You're, you can't. You're too stupid. You're bad. You're ugly. You're not good. You're not good. You know, because these are those things, the messages that, we, that were so strongly. I didn't go to residential school, but I still heard that message growing up in the, you know, the 70s and the 80s. That message was still very prevalent, you know, so people are fighting these things. And the bad feelings just build and build and build until one day they just boom, like a volcano. And who's gonna, who is going to be the target of that energy? The people closest to me, who are my family, the people in my community, my clan members, the people I work with, right? Like in the Yukon, the highest place of lateral violence are like the band offices, or they're not called band offices anymore, they're governments. But that's where people really experience lateral violence, like so, so, uh, on such a high level that we've heard, actually heard people say, I just drive up to the building and I feel like throwing up because I'm afraid of what's waiting for me in there. It's, a, it's fear, right? It starts turning into fear, anxiety, depression, all of these things when people are dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So we end up emotionally hurting the people we love the most. And those who have had courage to share their story and say, yeah, I do lateral violence, and I, I'm, I do, I've done lateral violence too, totally going to own that, been the target, definitely witnessed it. Um, and we've heard so many people say, I do this, and I don't even know I'm doing it because it's, be it's become so normalized. The behavior patterns have become so normalized in our community that people don't even realize they're doing it. But when they become aware, uh, we've heard so many brave you know, souls and individuals say, I don't want to do that. I do not want to do that. And so I'm going to be very intentional, work towards changing this phenomena, which is incredible. So just to go a little bit deeper 
on what's going on with people because we have to understand. You know, I, I know prior to doing this work, someone would be, you know, all lateral violence and I'd just be like, ugh, you know, just write them off, you know, just avoid them, uh, walk three blocks around them so I don't have to deal with them. But now I realize that's not how we're going to solve this problem, by further isolating and hurting our own people by, you know, lateral violence sending back. So we are all born, you know, wanting connection. It's a basic human need. We spend our whole lives uh, working towards connection with other human beings. And along the line, especially with residential school and those kinds of things, um, a lot of our, you know, our uh, ancestors and grandparents and parents learned that connection equated to being hurt, right? Like I was removed from my family. I tried to connect with people, but I just got hurt over and over again. So they learned that. And as a result, they realize when I try to connect, I only experience the most painful feelings, emotional feelings that I've ever known. Things like um, isolation, things like you don't love me, things like um, I don't know what unconditional love is. There's always conditions to people loving me. And what happens is when people have painful feelings, lots of times they build the wall, you know, like you've heard of the wall before. They build up a wall around them, a fortress. So I don't have to feel things and do all sorts of things, you know, to avoid feeling those things. Substance abuse, you know, drugs and alcohol, all of these things that just make us feel numb. And also what we've learned along the way is like even more painful is not feeling anything. It's just not feeling any emotions. You know, I've heard someone say, I'd rather feel pain than nothing because feeling nothing is such a void you know, in the human experience, that it's just, you know, it's just hard to go anywhere from there. Um, also, Brene Brown, who I'm sure you, uh, many of you are aware of, says, you know, humans spend a lot of time trying to numb pain, but you can't selectively numb out emotions. If you're numbing pain, you're numbing joy as well. So you're not feeling anything. And it's a terrible place for a human being to not be able to feel anything. So we put up this big wall and start you know, um, developing survival styles. And we really, Thomas and I really believe that lateral violence is a survival tech uh, strategy for people. You know, it's like, get away from me because I don't want to feel this. And I'm not connecting with you because you're going to just hurt me. So it's a survival style of what people do to push other people away from them. And then, um, you know, another, uh, further to that is that people don't act a lot of times in a way that aligns with what they're really feeling inside. So I feel, I feel hurt, I feel disconnected, I feel unloved, but how I'm going to present in the world is like, I'm, I'm stronger than anything. I don't need you, I don't have emotions. I don't need anyone. And I'm not gonna betray, you're not gonna betray me because I'm gonna betray you, right? So they, people really present in a way that is not reflective of what's really going on. So in the workshop, we really try to dive into this, you know, and this is just a small example of how we try to understand what's really going on underneath the surface so that we can, you know, uh, figure out together how we can, you know, address these things in a good way. So at the end of the day, many people have conflict with connection, right? And that's, and that's partly what's really going on. So a huge theme in the workshop is emotional and lateral violence is a way to cover up feelings of shame, humiliation, and vulnerability and replace them with the perception of pride and respect. A violence occurs when people see no means of undoing or preventing their own humiliation except by humiliating others. That comes from Dr. Jane, James uh, Gilligan who did a lot of work in like violence within prisons and all over the place. So. So switching now to lateral kindness, um, very early on, the term lateral kindness emerged. And basically, you know, how I saw it as an indigenous person is that it was the counter to lateral violence. And it was really, um, you know, like the rallying call to say that lateral violence is not who we are. It doesn't reflect who our teachings, our own values, you know, our own protocols, anything about us, but lateral kindness is. And I truly see it as an act of indigenous resistance because we are, you know, denouncing all of these things that happened and saying that does not have the power of, over me anymore. 
all of those things that happened, the intergenerational trauma, the residential school, the you know, removal of uh, any kind of human rights is not uh, you know, overpowering me. That I have enough strength and resistance in myself to say no. And I am going to reclaim back who I really am which is a kind, noble, and loving person. So it truly is an act of uh, resistance in, in, in my way of thinking. So what is lat lateral Indigenous kindness? It's when members of the same oppressed Indigenous community seek power by holding each other up emotionally. It's saying, I see you, you matter, and you belong here. It's acknowledgement, encouragement, support, inclusion, respect, appreciation, and really listening to somebody. It's all of these things that we know are, you know, deeply embedded in our, into our culture. But mainly, it's like, you know, um, for me, it's acknowledgement. It's providing emotional safety, which is another huge key, key thing. And you, pro you, you don't just hear this Indigenous community, you hear this all over the place. Because lots of corporations and, you know, big business and all of that have realized our, you know, um, our people are not coming here and showing up with everything they have if, they, if there's fear and if they're afraid and if they're not able to be authentic with who they are. People are much more innovative when they, when they feel um, you know, included, when they feel they, it's safe to learn. You know, I, can, I can actually not know how to do something and I'm not gonna be like you know, hung out in the middle of the town square. When I worked in my community, there's no way on God's green earth I would ever admit to anyone in that environment I actually don't know how to do like Excel that good. You know, like just fake it till you make it. Find some little, well, I did have a good ally in there. His name was Sasha. He was this German guy from Germany. <laughs> he was like the only guy that I was like, hey, can you help me a little bit with the budget? You know, because he didn't feel like he was going to like come at me. Um, safe to contribute. Uh, safe to challenge because we need to, we do need to challenge sometimes we do need to have questions we're not always going to agree and it needs to be a safe place for us to have disagreements but to be able to work through them in a good way um, so fear is the enemy it freezes innovation ties up creativity yields compliance instead of commitment and represses what would otherwise be an explosion of innovation so when we're working in a fear-based uh, you know, organization or community, we're not giving it our all. We're too busy protecting ourselves, hence lateral violence. So fostering emotional safety is an essential element for effective language learning too, and I believe that 100% is that these spaces need to be safe for our people. I've heard a lot of people, you know, say, I, I, I decided I'm going to learn our language. I went to language class, and the first thing that said to me was, you're saying that wrong in a really mean way. And so for some people, their response is, I'm out, I'm out, this, is too, this makes me feel too bad. You know? So we hear that a lot and we, sh we can't, we can't do that to people. We have to say, yake, that's good, you're doing good. Even if people say things, you know, and they're, tr they're trying. And we have to really foster this safe environment for people to do that. So the re realignment with our own values and enacting them is essential. Reclamation of our own identity with kindness, inclusion, building strong and safe communities, all of this is essential. Happy, healthy people feel safe and are willing to take more creative chances to present themselves authentically and to show up every day and give it their all. And this is what we want. This is, what we, this is a major, major part of what we call um, you know, healing and safety in our community. So very quickly, I just wanted to like, I just got, kind of want to tease you guys. We do have some tools about how to deal with lateral violence because that's another thing that we've heard is that a lot of people do take lateral violence classes, but it's just kind of, this is what lateral violence is. Don't do it. And then we're just kind of hanging there without any, anything, you know, to really help us. So in the moment, you know, we really recognize that uh, people can be very heightened in the moment when lateral violence is happening and uh, they need something simplistic to think about. So acknowledgement, you know, like I see you, I see you there, right? I see you there. I acknowledge there's a human being in front of me and I also acknowledge there's lateral violence happening. We have to be able to say stop. Right, because another thing I've learned and I know for myself is that people have been allowed to say and do whatever the hell they want to me. There's no boundaries in the indigenous community. You know, there's just zero boundaries. 
People have access to us all the time. And we have, to, we have to understand that we have absolutely the right to say, stop, stop, stop the lateral violence. You are not allowed to do this to me. You are not allowed to do this to me. And I'm going to be very controversial right now, and I'm going to say it doesn't matter if you're an elder or if you're a young person or if you're my boss. You are not allowed to be emotionally violent to me. It's not okay. Right? And so establishing the boundary, I'm going to ask you to stop. Uh, Kaylin, you're my, you know, my cousin, my best friend. I'm going to ask you to stop saying demeaning, belittling things to me. Thank you. And yes, we're going to continue on with our connection. If you can, if you can appreciate and acknowledge my boundary and understand that this is something that needs to happen, then we absolutely will continue our connection with each other. And I will even help whatever it is that you need. But you need to value and uh, um, hear my boundary, right? So it's a very simple tool, and we want it to be tool. There's other tools, too, but we don't have time to really get into it today. So connection, it's super important. We're not just going to write our people off. That does, also does not align with you know, our own values and who we are as a people. We're all in the canoe, you know, or we're all on the trail. We're all walking over the Chilku Trail. Some people are way up at the front, just Some people like me are at the back. <laughs> but we're still together. We're one people, right? And we can't leave people behind. So that doesn't fit in. So, it takes leadership and it takes intention. It also takes mentorship and commitment to be able to provide awareness and action for transforming, to providing you know, uh, an environment for transformative change. And a lot of that comes from just acknowledging we have this problem, we need to do some work here. How are we gonna do that work? Well, you know, uh, for us in Yukon, a, a million workshops. And sometimes we've had like people who've taken the workshop like seven times. You know, and we, we all know we're not going to change this with one workshop. We have a lot of work we need to do. Individuals need to work, need to do work. We need to do work as a community, right? But it does take um, absolutely intentional action, right, that we're going to change this. So if you can banish fear, install true performance-based accountability and create a nurturing environment that allows people to be vulnerable as they learn and grow, they will perform beyond your expectations and theirs. We're going to see huge change when we're able to provide these, you know, these, these spaces for each other. Um, lateral kindness is a movement now. It's become a movement. It's become a rallying call. Some people even use it as a safe word. You know, like people who shared, got real riled up at our staff meeting, and someone went, lateral kindness. And they're like, oh, yeah, OK. And everyone regulated themselves back to, you know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's so awesome. I think it's so awesome. Just a few pictures of some of the people you know, to believe, commit, and act on it. There's some pictures of some of the participants around, one's in Ottawa, one's in Newfoundland, one's in the Yukon. You know, like people, you know, our experience has, has been that people are really rallying around this concept and this movement. So they're really embracing it. And they're really saying, yes, we need to do this. We want to do this. This is what we need to do. This is an integral, huge part of our healing and our ability to move forward as a people. So that's all I have today for you. I want to say Gunashish Hawa, and I need a Simshian to say that for me. How do you say it? Okay, that's a hard thing. <laughs> I will, I'm sure I will learn. But I just wanted to leave a, little, a, a few minutes for any questions or any comments if anyone has any. Yeah? Does some of the reconciliation work with internal pain also move out into reconciling, I think you said, Canadians are working and reconciling between, how is that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You just actually said one of my like mantras is that I can't reconcile anything with anyone until I reconcile my own heart, right? So it's an interesting place in Canada right now because yeah, like government is really pushing this concept of reconciliation, but it's, um, it, it kind of becomes shallow. You know, it's just like, oh, yeah, we said we did a land acknowledgement, check. You know, where it's like, no, all of us have to. Uh, sometimes a little bit, yeah. You know, like, because our, the workshop is very, you know, focused on um, before we can reconcile with anyone else, like, I need to reconcile my own heart. I need to reconcile, 
you know, what's going on in my community before I can reconcile with anyone else. And, you know, a, a lot of times in Canada, it's like, you Indigenous people, you figure out reconciliation and then tell us, where it's like, this is our history. We are treaty people. We started on this path together as two sovereign nations, you know, like the earliest development of Canada and Indigenous people. We did not, uh, you know, uh, cede this land to you. We did not give it over. We entered into treaties, and the treaties obviously went extremely awry, you know, to the extent that now we're wards of the state and we have no rights and our children are being taken away. And every time someone wants what's on our land, we just get moved and displaced. So, uh, you know, my, my belief is that everyone in Canada needs to go back to our history and they need to face the pain of it. You know, we can't avoid and, and we, we can do that together. It's possible, you know, but um, like we're not anywhere near it right now. And I uh, fully believe that before I can reconcile with anyone else, I need to reconcile my own heart because there's a lot of pain, you know, a lot of pain in our Indigenous community. And a lot of, like, put on us as Indigenous people, probably, you know, in Canada and here as well. It's like, you guys figure out how to fix it and then tell us. And then we'll just be like, okay, we're reconciled. It doesn't work like that. It requires a lot of work, right? And this is part of it, for sure. Definitely part of it. Yeah. Hi, Lori. Yeah. Speaking to you, you don't know why. It's confusing. It's uh, I don't know how to address that. Mm -hmm. I I you know I could talk to you later, but I think you just need to be like, hello, you know, so and so. Uh, um, you know, I need to ask you why are you uh, you know ignoring me, and um, you know how can we work through this together? It's always about connection, right, and being able to like try to come to that space together or, you know, and maybe engage in ceremony. Um, I'm not sure if you could utilize the ABC tool, you know, of um, just simply saying, don't ignore me. You know, like, that's, that's really um, hurtful. You know, I'm going to ask you to stop ignoring me and let's sit down and talk to each other. So it's a trigger, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and it takes a lot of courage. To yes. Do what you're it does. So mm -hmm. courage, you just have to make a commitment then to... Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's so much that I've learned myself doing this work because my approach would be avoid at all cost, run for the hills, you know. Uh, but now I have like the, more tools to be able to like even establish a boundary to to understand what's going on is a huge one because a lot of times when people do you know uh, engage in lateral violence and direct it at us, immediately we internalize it. Oh, that was my fault. Why? Because I'm bad. You know, like, here's a good example. I'll give you guys a little um, teaser, too. Uh, we do a lot of, like, role-playing in the, in the workshop, and one of the ways that I've seen lateral violence happen a lot is what I call lateral violence stink eye. And now I've also developed the mean auntie look, because, um, you know, there's deadly auntie. There's also mean auntie, but my auntie's really sweet. But anyway, so anytime I walk into a space up into the Yukon where our people are gathered... And I'm out there in the arena a lot because I dance, right? And uh, I, I lead the Daka Kwan, so we're always out there doing something. And anyway, I walk into a space where a bunch of our people are gathered, and I, I look over, and I'll always see this. I look over, and someone goes <laughs> at me. <laughs> I'll do the mean auntie, too. Who wants to be the victim of mean auntie? Okay, I'll do, okay here's mean auntie. <laughs> You're just like, ah, <laughs> you know, and so I see that. And when that used to happen to me before, I'd be like, oh, no, what did I do? So-and-so doesn't like me. It's my fault. Oh, no. You know, and I'd sit there and not even be able to focus on what's going on. Oops, sorry. Okay, that's time. Um, not even be able to concentrate on what's happening. All I would do is take it all on and own it. It's my fault. I did something. Sit there and think about the last 20 years of every interaction we ever had, you know, and, like, just worry about it for the next three weeks. It's 3 in the morning. I can't sleep because I'm so worried about it. So we have to learn how to understand what is, belongs to me and what I own and what belongs to someone else, 
right? Because everyone, I'll end with this, we are all responsible for our own emotional energy. Yes. I can't fix you, I can't change you, but I can change how we interact. And I, can, I do have the right to say, don't do that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good to see you. All right. Yay. <laughs> have a great day, guys. And I'll see some of you tomorrow and on Friday in the workshop. So excited about that. And thank you, Ravens, up there for behaving yourselves. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs>